be velvet steel in a world of wimps and warriors. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. Some people are naturally aggressive and impressive. Some people, by their genetic disposition, by their family or life experiences, some people are naturally aggressive and impressive. They're the ones you notice when they walk into a room. They're the ones that usually lead in conversations if there's a group or could dominate. Some people are naturally aggressive and impressive, but not Timothy. To Timothy's name, we can add an adjective, timid Timothy. Now, not all the leaders in the New Testament tend to be timid. You can think of Jesus and his 12 disciples. Two of his disciples, James and John, although they become very loving men, start out quite aggressive. Jesus nicknames them the sons of thunder. And although we don't have a lot of descriptions of why Jesus calls them that, we do have the story where Jesus wants to go to a Samaritan village and they refuse him, and James and John actually ask permission from Jesus to call down fire from heaven and to torch the city. Hotheads, right? Aggressive, impressive, natural leaders, those who are quick to confront any sort of injustice. But that's not Timothy. And so as we look at this passage, we need to say, Timothy, be steel. We need to hear this because this passage is going to say there's a qualification here, but you and I need to understand that foremost in the Christian position of leadership and for all of us, we must be willing to be strong. We must be willing to be tough. We must be willing to confront. Paul to Timothy, be bold in correcting leaders and members. We're in chapter 5, but we've seen hints of this throughout the whole letter. Paul has said, I left you there at Ephesus to clean house. I left you there at Ephesus to silence false teacher. I left you there at Ephesus to teach the truth. I left you there, T Timothy, to rebuke and to correct. To live the Christian life today, you and I must be strong. We must be steel. We must stand for God's word. We cannot be wimps. Now, I understand that in the culture we're in and the church culture, sometimes things shift. And I think today, perhaps, in the church, we struggle more with being tough than being tender. When we hear words like confront, rebuke, correct, I think sometimes we draw back and we say, but isn't Christianity judge not lest you be judged? Shouldn't we just let everybody know that God loves them and, and there's no requirements? But as you read the Bible, as you read what Paul says to Timothy, there are moral issues worth confronting over, and you and I, all of us, should be willing to confront. And I say that because, remember, all of us are called to teach. Jesus said to all of us, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you. All of us have been commanded to teach. And we've seen this letter that some teach formally, church elders or preachers. Some teach informally by your life. And all teaching involves serving up the good and rejecting the bad. To be a good teacher, you teach the truth and you refute error. And what Paul's thinking about here is times where Timothy needs to say to an older man, See that in verse 1, because I'm going to read it. An older man, you have bad beliefs or bad behavior. Let's read what he says. Do not sharply rebuke the older man, but rather appeal to him as a father. To the younger men as brothers, the older women as mothers, and the younger women as sisters in all purity. Now we are going to look at this idea of how to rebuke. But understand that Timothy had just said by Paul, there are all sorts of people in the church that you're going to have to correct Timothy. You know this, Timothy. As a good shepherd, as a good pastor, you're going to have to correct older men. Timothy, have courage and boldness. You're going to have to correct women old enough to be your mother, but you're going to have to do it with courage. Younger men and younger women in the church, you may also have to tell them the way the Lord thinks See, Timothy, you've been in a confrontational role. You've been called to be a leader. 
you cannot be a wimp, you must be steel. Paul to Timothy, be bold in correcting leaders and members. And all of us need to hear that. Paul doesn't say to Timothy, don't correct, say it's okay, everything's fine, God loves you and everything's acceptable. No, God loves you and he's got a good plan for your life. And sometimes that means we have to correct people and put it back on the path. Be steel. And then I see the bulk of the passage is an emphasis upon how we do it. All of us have had this experience. We've done the right thing the wrong way. We look back and say, I knew the right thing to do, the right thing to say, and I said it the wrong way. Most of us don't make mistakes in what we do, it's how we do it. Because God wants us to do things the right way and do the right thing. And so Paul says to Timothy, in your confronting, in your correcting, I want you to use a scalpel, not a sword. Do not sharply rebuke an older man. This is the imagery of a verbal assault. All of us know that the childhood rhyme is wrong. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. No, words can wound. Words can kill, can't they? Paul says to Timothy, now, you're going to have to cut on some lives here, but grab the scalpel, not the sword. See, the world gets angry. The world gets confrontational. The world gets aggressive. The world will destroy you with their words. When people in the world, people who are not Christians, confront, they do it with too much force, too much strength. They're too tough. They come, and in an offensive way, they attack you with words. They belittle, they manipulate, they beat down. And Paul says to Timothy, even though you're an elder, Timothy, even though you're in charge, even though you're the shepherd, you must do it as tender velvet. You must be velvet steel. Here's what he says. Make toughness and tenderness hold hands. You see, you have to be tough, Timothy. You have to confront but you have to do it in a tender way. Notice, don't rebuke, but appeal. Timothy, when you're dealing with older men, appeal to them the way you would your father. And Timothy actually would have a lot of experience with this because Timothy's father was not a believer. So Timothy had grown up with a Christian mother and a Christian grandmother, and he had grown up to be respectful and honoring of his father who was not a believer. His father was a Greek, his mother was a Jew, his mother was saved, his dad was not, but Timothy knew how to appeal to his father. All of us do that, right? We learn how to be respectful of our fathers, or we pay the price. So, Timothy, toughness and tenderness must hold in. You must hold them together. And here we're really talking about the biblical idea of gentleness. Gentleness, which I would say is using just enough force. So if you go to crack the eggs in the morning for the frying pan, you want to use just enough force to crack them, but not shatter the egg pieces, right? If you pick up a baby, you want to use just enough force to secure the baby, but not hurt the baby. Gentleness is toughness and tenderness together. Gentleness is not being weak or being wimpy, but gentleness is not being overpowering. Do you know that we're actually told in the Old Testament who the gentlest man on earth was? The meekest man on earth, meek and gentle mean the same thing. And you know why it's hard to remember this? Because it's mighty Moses. Mighty Moses. Now, you like me, when we think of Moses, we think of a man who could stand before Pharaoh. A man who could call down the plagues of heaven. The man who could part the Red Sea and then close it over Pharaoh's armies. The man who can go to Mount Sinai and stand in the very presence of God. The man who could condemn rebels and the ground would open up and swallow them. The man who could strike a rock and water would pour. Mighty Moses, tough. You'd be hard pressed to find somebody tougher than Moses in the Old Testament. He has critics, he has cynics, he has a bunch of wayward people, and he leads them out to become the mighty nation of Israel in the wilderness. Forty years. Tough Moses. And yet we're told that he was tender. He was tender. He was a shepherd. He was tender with his flock of Israelites. He was tender with his family. We're told that he was gentle. 
He was a gentle leader. Moses held together toughness and tenderness. And Timothy should, and you and I should too. We could also say that we keep holy authority and humble attitude together. So Paul's saying, Timothy, here's how you need to think about it. When you have a confrontation, you're going with holy authority, but a humble attitude. Jesus taught this in one of the most dramatic passages in the Bible. It's Matthew chapter 18. And the disciples have been having a stupid argument. They're having an argument over who's going to be greatest. So they're saying, Jesus is going to be king, but then who's going to be number one? And they actually, in their foolishness, have the audacity to ask Jesus. And what I love about the passage is Jesus doesn't say to them, you won't have authority. Knock it off. Or you won't have power. Or you won't have a role in the kingdom. Instead, he says, he brings a little child, and he picks the child up in his arms, and he says, first of all, you need to be humble to be saved. If you don't humble yourself like this little child, you won't even be part of my kingdom. See, humility is the way to enter if any of us enter heaven. Humility is the way to enter any of us in the Christian life by confessing our sins and being humble by being corrected. Notice the link here. We're to correct other Christians when necessary, and God corrects us when we get saved. To be a Christian is to be one who's been corrected by God Almighty. Jesus says, if you want to be great in my kingdom, if you want to have holy authority, you need to have a humble attitude. You need to be saved. And 11 of them are saved, and Judas is not, even though he hears this. And then Jesus says, if you'll serve one another and be the slave to one another, you'll be the greatest. Jesus says, the path to greatness, the path to holy authority in my kingdom is a humble attitude. If you will serve one another, you will be the greatest. And then he says, if you receive a child in my name, if you'll stoop and let the little ones in, if you'll be tender enough to receive a child, you'll be the greatest. So Jesus taught his apostles, you have authority, but you also have humility. Paul to Timothy, oh Timothy, you have authority. When you teach God's word, you speak on behalf of God. Whether people hear you or ignore you will determine their destiny. And Timothy, as their shepherding pastor, when you speak on moral issues, they better listen. Because if they don't, they don't answer to you, but to God. But don't do it in an angry way. Do it with gentleness. Do it with appeal. The key here is the idea of family. Notice it, that Paul mentions it twice. Father, brothers, mothers, sisters. Father, brothers, mother, sister. And so I think that we can say there's several ways that the key to this, the key to this kind of confrontation is to remember family. And the first I've already hinted at, that's to remember that you are family and why. So, Timothy, as you look out on your congregation, you need to say, that's my father, mother, brother, and sister because God has become. Because we've been saved, we've been made part of one family. No one has God as their father who doesn't belong to the church family. Now Paul says to Timothy, remember that when you gather together with others who have been saved by grace, saved by the gospel, they're family to you. They're family to you, Timothy. And so out of love and respect for your heavenly father, now you show love and respect for them. Always remember that you're linked together. And here I, I simply want to pause and say to those who are watching, you need to make sure that your family of God. It's possible to be a visitor at church. It's possible to watch a, a video online preaching. It's possible to think that you belong to the family of God, but you don't. No one's born family of God. No one's born of God as their heavenly father. We're born sons and daughters of Satan. We're born children around. And so you need to ask yourself, has there ever been a point that you've received the gospel? That you've come, God's corrected you, so you've repented. You've said, God, you're right, my life is a mess. You're correcting me with your word. Yes, I'm so sorry for the way I've lived, but I believe that you can save me through your son. I believe that because of my correction, you put your punishment on Jesus. And right now, I believe by faith that you'll save me. And when you do that, you come into a wonderful church family and you have brothers and sisters and, and fathers and mothers. 
And in that community, then, we keep building each other up and correcting each other one, and loving one another and encouraging one another because we're family of God. So the key here is to remember that you are family and why. And then, with that in mind, we go and we gently nudge each other. We appeal to one another. Now, here's the great thing. If you speak to an older man in your church and you say, hey, God's word says but I don't think that you're doing that, honestly, often they'll agree with you. Why? Because they've already been corrected once. They're a safe saint, right? And I guarantee that you'll never confront a Christian that the Holy Spirit hasn't already confronted. So if you have the audacity to do what the Bible says and go confront another Christian in their sin, guess what? You're not the first person to speak to them. If you have to say, I, I think you're a little prideful, the Holy Spirit has already told you. If they're a child of God. If you say, the way you're doing that, living with another person in sin, living with somebody who's not your spouse, that's wrong. They already know that. You see, the Holy Spirit of God convicts genuine believers, and you simply go along and you provide the human voice. And you say, you know it's wrong. God wants me to help you with this. And you need to let it go, brother. You need to let it go, father, mother, sister. It's compromising your life. And if you continue to live a compromised life, I'm not sure you're going to go to heaven with us. We want to all go to heaven together. When we all go to heaven, what a day of rejoicing will be. But you're got off the path. And I'm here in love to gently appeal to you to get it right. You see, the key is family. For Timothy, this is going to work out in the way that's public speaking and private speaking. The way he's going to be public teaching and, and private rebuke. Because again, he's a leader. Now, I understand that for the average Christian, all of their correction will be private. Right? I get that. That if you're in the church and you see a Christian sinning and God wants you to confront them, it won't be done publicly. But think of what a pastor does week by week, an elder. They stand up and as they speak God's word, what happens? Well, encouragement and grace and correction. Every time a pastor speaks the truth, there's some confrontation that occurs. And so, notice that this applies to the way that we preach. And here I, I'm going to have to criticize some of my own profession, and maybe some pastors you know from the past. Have you ever sat under the preaching of a pastor who yelled and shouted, who glared, pointed, stomped their feet, and looked angry and flushed? It's a sin. That pastor has lost their temper. They've lost control of themselves. May I say to you that Jesus never shouted at somebody when he talked. Jesus never raised his voice in public teaching, and the only time he might have shouted was to cleanse the temple. Jesus was calm and gracious and loving, and thousands of people followed him. They followed him because his words were gentle and gracious, and they fell from his lips beautifully. Jesus was always gentle. At the beginning of the service, I read that passage where Jesus said, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. Gentle and humble, Jesus never manipulated people emotionally. Jesus, who is gentle and humble in heart, never put on airs or authority or shouted. Listen, I know we're Baptists. And I know that in the 50s and 60s and 70s, Hellfire and brimstone preaching was very popular. And I don't have any problem with preachers telling people they're going to hell if they don't repent. But getting angry about it, glaring at people, manipulating people is wrong. And it happens today. Sometimes people will say, well, that pastor is a teacher, not a preacher. Well, what's the difference? Well, he doesn't shout and yell and make me feel small. No, that's not the difference between teaching and preaching. You see, sometimes people want the preacher to stand up on Sunday morning and give it to the people and get after those people. And you pastor, you tell it as it is. I hadn't been very here very long at this church, and somebody said, Pastor, when are you going to yell at the youth in the balcony? And I thought about that, and I said, the day I lose my temper, I need to repent. Far be it from me. First of all, our youth weren't messing around. And second of all, what kind of preacher yells at youth in a church service? Not one who's being gentle and gracious. You see, Timothy, with younger men, treat them as brothers. Do you regularly yell at your brothers? No, brothers, weakness I got to do here, loving. 
So here we see that God has given us the family we're grown up in to show us how to live in the church. With our parents, we always honored them, even if we couldn't obey them. And we always honored them, even if we corrected them. Isn't that the case, right? That if you have to say to your older mother or dad, hey, you're wrong about this, you do it in a gracious way, you appeal to them. And with your siblings, although you, you might fight among yourselves, you know that you were unified with affection, right? You were protective and loving, and you would have done anything for the sibling. And so God has blessed us. He's given us the family that we grew up in as a model of the church. Now, if you grew up in a dysfunctional family, you might have to learn in the church how to treat brothers and sisters. It might go the other way. If you grew up in a family that didn't handle conflict well, you might have to say, okay, I'm going to learn how to handle conflict and confrontation here so I can take it back to my family. But as God planned it, Graceful, gracious, godly parents should have taught you how to treat your siblings. That's how you treat us in the church. It's appropriate for Timothy in public teaching. It's, a public, it's appropriate in private rebuke. So no matter who it is, even if it's a false teacher, Timothy's to go and say, I appeal to you, but the grace of Jesus stop doing this. Do not shrug or even put all the So Timothy, be steel, but be velvet steel. Hold toughness and tenderness together. You know, if we do this, this will protect us from three sins that are quite, uh, quite common in our churches today. You see, you and I don't have an option. When we see sin in other Christians, we must confront lovingly. And if we don't, one of three sins will spring out of us. And they're all bad. One is we can be permissive wimps. Permissive wimps. So you see another Christian in your church sinning. And you say no. And you say to yourself, I think I'm a good Christian. Judge not lest you be judged. And you just let it go. You're not honoring God and you're not helping that person. You see, sin is a problem that needs to be fixed. Paul had this problem in the Corinthian church. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians. He said, on Sunday morning, somebody shows up and they're actually committing incest and you haven't corrected them. And Paul says to the Corinthian church, stop being permissive whims. You need to confront them because their souls are and so, I, I, again, I know this is the era of our culture today, the world, everything's fine, and our churches, we tend to say, God loves you, He's got a good plan for you, and however you live is okay, but you and I need to be willing to say to people, I am not a whim. I will stand for Jesus, and I will tell you the truth. The other option would be to be a verbal assailant. So, so you've decided that you need to confront sin, and you go over and you just slam blast them. You totally ignore this, and you get so mad because you hate that sin, or you get so mad because you hate that political view, or you get so mad because of the you go over and you just lash them physically. Again, this word of sharp rebuke is to physically assault. All of us know what this is, right? Don't you have from childhood memories of words said to you that sting, and maybe still sting, right? We know what it's like to be attacked verbally, right? Verbal judo, okay? And so... In our churches, if we don't do velvet steel and confrontation, we might be permissive whims or we might be verbal assailants. I've met them in churches. People will just let you know what's on their mind. They just let you have it. And they don't care about grace or mercy. See? They should have done it gently. They might have even said the right thing but the wrong way. And they're sitting next to the, the permissive whim who's never going to tell you the truth. Or, maybe the most common, backbiting gossips. Backbiting gossips. I believe in the church that the reason why people gossip is because they see something that's true and they handle it the wrong way. So they see a Christian doing something the wrong way and they should be steel. They should confront that person in a gentle way. But instead, they remain silent. Now, they're not a permissive whim. They don't say, oh, it's fine. They say, no, it's a problem and I'm going to tell so-and-so. You see what they do? They divert. They're stirred up. They know something's wrong. And instead of confronting and being strong and helping, they go and tell somebody else. You and I will either do the right thing with tough and tender confrontation of church, velvet steel, or we'll call it money sense. And then I also see that honoring includes helping. Honoring includes helping. Now, now we're only going to begin this today, and I'm very excited next week to come back and talk about widows. But verse 3 says, honor widows who are widows indeed. 
Honor widows who are widows indeed. So Paul here says, you know that God has always cared for widows. He's always cared for those that society doesn't care for. And Paul says, I want you to continue this. Here, we're just continuing the Old Testament concern for this advantage. In the Old Testament, God said to Israel, you better take care of widows and orphans and aliens. And I'll give you three examples. When farmers clean their fields, they will leave some grain or some grapes or whatever they're harvesting behind. So you can go through it and collect your harvest, but don't collect every bit of it. Leave some at the corners, and if you happen to drop some, leave it. So that every poor person, widow or orphan, could come along and they could get enough to eat if they would work in your field. They could come after your harvesters. It was a gracious way of providing social security. If you were willing to work, you could eat. And then every three years, farmers were to take some of their produce and take it into the town and deposit it in the town, and anybody who needed it could have it. It was like an ancient food bank. So no widow or no orphan or no alien in ancient Israel should have ever starved because God loved them. The other thing that we read is that when it became a, a lawsuit or a legal issue, that the judges in Israel were warned that they may, must take care of widows and orphans. It would be really easy to side with the wealthy landowner or the wealthy woman in town, but instead the judges in Israel were warned, you better do justice to the disadvantaged or God will get you. And then finally, we know this didn't always happen because many times the prophets say to Israel, you're sinning against God, and the way you're sinning is by mistreating people. And often they say things like, you haven't taken care of the widows and the orphans. Isaiah chapter 1, Isaiah calls Israel to repentance, to come back, to come and reason with God, and though your sins are scarlet, God will make them like white. And he says, plead for the widow and the orphan. You show God you love them by the way you treat. Honoring includes help. Now, not everyone should be helped two reasons. And this will lead us to the launching point for next week. Not all should help because they have family. Verse 4. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, they must first elect learn to practice piety in regard to their own family and to make some return to their parents. For this is acceptable in the sight of God. So, Paul says to Timothy, you don't need to financially provide for widows if they have family. Because their biological families are the first line of support in the church. In fact, in verse 8, he says, if their biological family doesn't take care of them, they're not Christians. That's my take. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially to those of the household of faith, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So it's very weighty responsibility, right? That we take care of our biological parents. Even in their old age, here it's very biblical. And Tim, Paul says to Timothy, the Christian church should be taking care of their widows, but if a widow doesn't have family, Timothy, it's on you. you got to take care of them. And the church should not help all because some are not God. This is quite amazing. Timothy, there are widows in need in your church, but the only widows you should help are God. You should not feed ungodly widows. And next week, we get to look at this beautiful, long description of what a godly widow looks like. As Paul says, godly widows are gifts from God. And if she's a godly woman, if she's a godly widow, then show her all honor and deed. That's where we'll continue next week. Let's make some applications. On being tough and tender, how are you and I going to apply this? Number one. Rebuke when necessary. Rebuke when necessary. If you are regularly in the church of Jesus Christ and you're around other Christians, you will see sin. And when you see sin in people's lives, you, you probably need to first pray about it and see if they'll change, and then you need to go and confront. The greatest love you can show another Christian is to say, I want you to live the best life now, full of joy and grace, I'm the best life in heaven someday, and you need to fix this. And I'm doing this, and I'm appealing to you as a family member. And I'm not doing this because I'm perfect. I'm imperfect. Maybe you need to name some of your own sins you're struggling with, and you say, together, let me help you do this. God's grace will flow through you. That's one thing. 
be, be rebuked when necessary. Number two, tame that temper. Now, some of you don't have temper problems. Some of you are aggressive. That's great. You won't have a temper issue. But some of you do. And maybe you blame it on your family, or you blame it on your ethnicity, or you blame it on the trauma and drama in your life. You blame it and you say, I get a pass. I can be a hothead because. Not as a Christian. If God has taken his anger toward you and put it on Jesus so that you're no longer under his angry wrath, what right do you have to be angry with another Christian? None. So you need to tame the temper. You need to let it go. You need to be gracious and loving. You need to deal with that temper issue. And I know some of you today are hearing me and you need to repent of your temper and the way you speak to others. You're steel, but you're not velvet steel. You need to repent. Number three, Keep your church family close like your own family. Do you see the link here? Be close to your biological family and honor them. Be close to your church family. The godly Christian man or woman has a close biological family as close as possible. I understand there's limits with unbelievers. And a close church family. So that the way you treat your family during the week and the way you treat your church family on Sunday are the same. Number four, pray for continued unity and peace in the church. Wherever you're at, whether you're in our church or the church, it is always right to pray for unity. And if you're in a season of unity in church, rejoice and keep praying for it. And if there's division and tension and anger and some of the things we've talked about today, pray that the Holy Spirit will take care of that. We should always pray for unity and peace in the church. That's the sign to the world that something supernatural has occurred here. If you and I have peace in the church, then people can come into the church and find peace with God. Number five, give practical help to hurting Christians. You see, we say to somebody, I know you're in need. I'll pray for you. That's great. And I'll provide for you. God intends in the church that we not only pray for people when we provide for them, that those who are in our church are needy are supportive. That we meet practically, we give people rights to the doctor if they need them. We help them across the party. Whatever they need, we help them with. Number six, let us praise Jesus. Think about his life. He gently lived and violently died, which is gently saved. He surpasses Moses. He was the gentlest man who ever lived. And he came knowing that a violent death would take him, that he might gently save you. Praise Jesus today.